I'm gone. Welcome, everyone, to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. This was a historic weekend. Not in a nice way, but it was. Djokovic, the fastest defeat on clay in his career, 67 minutes. The fewest games won at a Masters 1000 event since 2014. He heads into Roland Garros with no finals after his earliest Rome defeat in his career. Of course, that was all to Alejandro Tabilo in the second round. It all came just one day removed from Rafael Nadal, winning just four games against Hubert Hurkacz, most lopsided loss on clay of his career, tied with a couple of other matches. Only thing is, those matches took place when he was 15 years old and 16 years old. Shout out to Juan Ignacio on Twitter for digging that up. I don't think there's ever been a moment in the last two decades where all three, of course, one of them retired, have all looked so far from the top of the game at the same time. I don't think there's been a single moment in the last 20 years that feels like right now. So I'm going to break down where we're at with both of them, talk about those matches, and then at the end, I'm going to do some Rome draw notes. But first, a message from our sponsor, TC Plus. The biggest names in tennis are coming to Paris for the most anticipated French Open in years, and Tennis Channel Plus is your place to watch. Stream every court from your smart TV or your phone live in HD. Experience three weeks of unparalleled tournament access as the world's top players in tennis face off against each other. Will the veteran champions continue their dominance or will a fresh face emerge to continue their legacy on the clay courts? Daily live coverage of this epic showdown begins Monday, May 20th. Don't miss a matchup. Stream it now with Tennis Channel Plus to be there when it all happens. Also a reminder that my newsletter, The Draw, comes out every Tuesday morning. It's a curation of the best tennis content on the internet every week. This week, got some good uh, good stuff. A great piece on how the pros adjust to clay. Well-sourced article in The Guardian. Big racket change. Player that you'll be very familiar with, switching from head to Yonex. Ben Shelton's mentality, a, a unique one and a great piece on that. Much, much more coming up in the draw this week. You can subscribe with the link in the description or go to thedraw.tennis slash subscribe. Let's start with Novak Djokovic. Where are we at right now after what has been uh, a 2024 that has been a lot more difficult than I think anybody would have expected? In order to talk about the, the Tabilo match, you, you kind of have to start by addressing the water bottle. I think you have to. And what I would say about this is the effect that that incident, of course, signing autographs after the match with Quarantine Mute, a fan leans over off of the kind of the balcony and based on the angle with the fan leaning over for, for an autograph, the water bottle slipped out of his the his backpack pocket and landed right on top of Novak Djokovic's head while Novak was looking down he would have had no way of seeing it coming the the effect of that on what happened two days later in the tennis match one isn't obvious and two isn't even knowable so you can have a feeling on it or you can have some sort of opinion on it but if you feel positive on either end of the spectrum you're probably letting your biases get in the way. If you're thinking there's there's no doubt in my mind that like Djokovic was concussed and that's why he couldn't play well against Tabilo. Or if you're on the other end and you're like, there's no way that Djokovic was still feeling the effects of that when he played Tabilo and that is simply a, an unreasonable excuse. I think both ends of the spectrum are wrong. Because even Djokovic seemed unsure of himself. Obviously, he was asked about the bottle incident, how it affected him. him. Here's what he said. Quote, I don't know, to be honest. I have to check that. Training was different. I was kind of going for an easy training yesterday. I didn't feel anything, but I also didn't feel the same. 
Today, under high stress, it was quite bad, not in terms of pain, but in terms of balance, just no coordination, completely different player from what it was two nights ago. Could be. I don't know. I have to do medical checkups and see what's going on. And it's Novak Djokovic's head. So if Novak doesn't know, at least wasn't confident enough to, to really take a stand in his post-match press conference, I don't think we should be taking a stand either. But what we can do is we can account for both scenarios and we can kind of look at the bigger picture. And for me, I'm not going to lie, the concern level rises quite a bit. Again, maybe it can be explained away by the water bottle incident, but I, I'm not 100% sure. And overall, the concern level rises for me because this was another flat performance emotionally, which we've seen a couple of times throughout the year. And you've been able to write it off, particularly when you look at an event like Indian Wells, where it was quite obvious the motivation wasn't there. But this, of course, is a prime calendar spot. And as you would have known if you watched the preview, I was kind of expecting a, a Djokovic who is determined to quiet the doubters ahead of Roland Garros. And the more times we see him subpar this year, the less convincing all of these possible explanations become. The fact that in Australia, he had the arm injury and then he had the illness. The fact that he's never played well in March, so you can throw away the Indian Wells result, and he's never played that well in Monte Carlo, so the fact that he made the semifinal actually felt like a positive at the time. And this was only his fourth event of the year because, in general, he's been trying to play as light a schedule as possible, and it's something that's worked for him. You know, you can keep explaining these things away, and now you can go to the water bottle, but Joel Drucker said it well on our episode of three. When you keep seeing outliers, they start to look more like inliers. And I don't know if that's a word or not, but it's certainly a good way to put it. You also have the fact that motivation has always been, for me, Djokovic's primary threat when it comes to his aging process or his, you know, age-related decline. Now, I've said for a long time, for years, that as Novak Djokovic breaks every record that he set out to break or that anybody even can set out to break and his main rivals fade, that motivation was going to be the biggest threat to... Djokovic's potential decline, which is different for most players because for most players, it's your body breaks down. But since Novak just hadn't been showing any signs that the body was was declining at what would be a normal rate for somebody in their mid-30s, I've always thought, no, it's not actually the body. It's probably the motivation that is going to ultimately spell the end for Djokovic whenever that time comes. And if you're looking for signs of motivation loss you'll find them. You'll find them this year. Which in the bigger picture would come as no surprise, but at the end of the day, I thought the Olympics would keep him going this year. So I never thought that it would really come to the forefront if it is coming to the forefront this year. But let me address that kind of bigger question, right? How can you see motivation? If you're like, Gil, what do you mean if you're looking for signs of motivation loss, you'll find them? What are those signs? And I just think looking at this Tabilo match, there were multiple ways in which Djokovic did not compete as hard as he usually does. Now, the most noticeable thing, and something that kind of anybody could have picked up on, no matter what level of, I don't know, technical nuance uh, you have the ability to spot, I mean, his pacing was was noticeable in the sense that Novak was rushing for most of the match, which is a sign that you're not you're not all that locked in. You're trying to kind of get things over with. You may not be fully invested in the outcome. I mean, when you break your routines, it's usually a sign of apathy, caring less. But as you know, I I care much less about what players are doing in between the points. I mean, we can all be body language doctors and we can look at those things to give us clues. But, you know, I've always said, like, forget between the points. Tennis matches are won during the points. 
And that's where I continue to see stuff that suggested that, you know, Novak just wasn't competing all that hard. So, you know, first thing is when he had to defend, like when he was in trouble and, and Tabilo had a ball to attack, Novak was usually anticipating way too hard or moving too early. So instead of, instead of kind of backing up, and maybe leaning one way or the other, but kind of waiting until the last possible mo moment to to kind of make that move. He would, you know, kind of sell out into one corner and the other. And there were so many occasions where Tabilo would have a short forehand. Djokovic would move super early to one end. And Tabilo would just have like the easiest kind of... It was just so easy for him to kind of crank the forehand into... Because he, he could hold it also. And, you know, he, he would just have a lot of court to hit into for, I'd say, like routine forehand winners where I think a, a Djokovic that was being a little bit more stubborn would have either not have anticipated as hard or at least waited longer to make the move so Tabilo couldn't basically see where Djokovic was going and go the other way. When you are kind of selling out early, that's usually an effort thing. Like, that's usually... A, I am kind of bailing on this point. And if they hit it to the corner that I'm going to sell out to, then maybe I'll, you know, find a way to counter and find a way back into the point. But that's not somebody who's ready to give themselves the best chance to successfully scramble and come back in the point. Another thing, there is no push at the end of the first set to gain some traction. Here's an example of when there was. 2021 Roland Garros semifinal. Djokovic is down five love to Nadal. He gets one break back. He almost gets the second break back. Loses the first set 6-3, but he's already shifted the match back in his direction. Anybody who watched the match knows that even though Djokovic lost the first set 6-3, the push that he was able to make towards the end of the first set was absolutely critical in terms of the the overall outcome, the ultimate outcome of the match, where Djokovic was able to turn the tables and beat Rafael Nadal in that semifinal in Paris. That's the normal Djokovic. That's a Djokovic who understands that, okay, I'm down five love in this set, but I can still emotionally, psychologically, tactically start to turn some things around. There was just no push from him in this match. He was obviously, you know, very out of rhythm, as we'll discuss. So you'd think maybe make an effort to get into some extended rallies, simplify big targets, a lot of cross court, try to, you know, get the feet moving, get some feel and some timing. He did the opposite. He actually doubled down on drop shots, doubled down on, you know, coming forward quickly and, and finishing points quickly. That's not a guy who's trying to find his way back into the match. And then, you know, the, there was maybe somewhat of an effort to reset in the second set, uh, but Tabila was able to get an early lead there. So that's the emotional part, the mental part. There was also just execution issues at the root of it. A lot of footwork problems for Djokovic, particularly on the forehand. You know, he was too close to the ball several times, too far away from the ball sometimes. And you see him when, when his setup is off, he loses balance. Pretty typical, you know, it's what happens to most players. Uh, but for Djokovic, as we've discussed in the past, it's pretty jarring when that happens because he's normally so precise in his ability to set up for the ball. And whenever his feet are in the right position, his balance is world class, even when he's on the run. But as a result of this, you know, in his own words, said this in the post-match press conference, no rhythm, no tempo, no balance. And he never really got to hitting from either wing with any sort of conviction. And I also saw this when it came to him trying to absorb pace because when the ball came quick, his feet seemed to stop and it almost looked like he was getting knocked backwards whenever Tabilo was really able to get hit, get everything on the ball because Djokovic's feet had stopped, you know, and he just wasn't able to get behind the ball and to get his weight forward. Um, or or at least get his weight centered when he was trying to absorb pace. Novak also, and I could have put this in the 
in the other category, in the mental category. But he got really drop shot happy before ever threatening with his ground stroke power. And this was this was almost the first thing you would have noticed. If, if you watched the first set carefully, Novak wasn't really hitting any driven ground stroke winners, but he kept hitting drop shots. You have to threaten with the power to open up the drop shot. Tabilo was not retreating far behind the baseline. He was playing aggressive, hitting big. Djokovic was just going for low percentage drop shots. But it's like when you're when you've hit six drop shots before you've hit a single driven ground stroke winner, like that's just a disastrous formula. That's never going to work because you're clearly not executing that push and pull that a that a drop shot. Like, if if you're not threatening with power, you're never going to open up the drop shot. You're never going to get in a, into a position where it's available and you have your opponent sufficiently moving backwards or kind of bracing themselves in a way where they're not going to get onto the drop shot quickly. So it's not like, look, Novak actually executed some drop shots brilliantly, uh, but they were really never very well set up. And for him to get that drop shot happy, um, again, suggested that the decision-making was was off. Uh, last thing, double faults, two in the first game of the match, two in the first game of the second set. Those were both, you know, service breaks for Tabilo. And then a double on match point at 30-40 when he was only down one break. You know, I didn't really feel great about Djokovic's chances of winning the match at that point. But, you know, one break, you want to obviously win that point, hold serve, make Tabilo serve it out. And uh, the drop shot gave him no chance of doing that. So that's the Djokovic story. I, I do want to say some things about Tabilo. I mean, he's got a huge game. His serve and his forehand made this look like a fast court against an average mover. Meanwhile, He's playing in Rome against Djokovic. When he had time on his forehand, it was just a cannon. He was really suffocating on second serve returns. He was taking it early, hitting it really big off of uh, off of his backhand as well. So even though he's a lefty, um, and lefties tend to get more forehands on second serve returns, um, even when Djokovic was finding the backhand, uh, you know, Tabilo was uh, really, really suffocating there. And he played exactly the same from start to finish. You know, no signs of nerves. Didn't have a passive reaction to Djokovic missing more than usual, which I think some players might have fallen into that trap. You know, seeing some uncharacteristic errors coming off of the racket against Djokovic and then uh, reacting in a way where, okay, I'm just going to hold back a little bit and hope to win that way. And Tabilo didn't do that. Uh, he kept going after his shots, and he really he never stopped. So... You know I'm a big fan of Tabilo. I think I've made him dark horse in uh, the two clay court masters before this one, Monte Carlo and Madrid. So, uh, you know, naturally, as soon as I give the whole dark horse thing a rest, he has the biggest win of his career and uh, is still alive in the tournament with a chance to make a run here in Rome. Let's go to Nadal Hurkacz. The dynamics that played out in Nadal Hurkacz are something I would have never predicted. I couldn't believe how good Hurkacz's movement looked. Absolutely tremendous. To the point where Nadal really struggled to finish with his forehand and spent large swaths of the match dictating with his forehand which is usually an absolute death sentence against Nadal on clay. Like the last thing you want to allow to happen when you're playing Nadal on clay is to let him grab a hold of the point, you know, give him offensive positioning in the point off of his forehand wing. And Hercotch, he just kept absorbing it. And like it, it, it was hard to. It's hard for me to kind of explain 
what was, you know, what were the circumstances that allowed that to happen? Like, was there a little bit less juice on Nadal's forehand? Maybe, but I'd really want that to be backed up statistically. What I do know is that Hercotch was dropping back deep in the court, uh, was and and was just moving extremely well and defending uh, beautifully. And then the result with Nadal just not able to actually find finishes off of his forehand, which again just sounds weird to say. He he was getting insecure. He was going to the drop shot in order to finish. You know, at times probably not in good enough position to hit it. There were even some net approaches that weren't quite there, you know, where Nadal looked to force it a little bit. And then, you know, Rafa's serve plus one was non-existent. Uh, Hubie, again, was standing real deep and striking solid returns. No free points for Rafa until midway through the second set. And really no serve plus one success for Rafa until midway through the second set because it was uh, it was really just easy neutralizations off of the Hercotch return, or I don't want to say easy as if uh, it, it wasn't impressive on Hercotch's part. It was, particularly because Nadal was serving a lot better than he was, you know, back in Barcelona. Like, this wasn't a really, really soft Barcelona-like start-the-point slice serve every time. It was something more than that, but it was no match for Hercotch's return. And I'll talk more about Rafa's serving in a moment. But uh, I'm not done with the Hercotch performance because it was more than defense. His ball striking looked very stable off of both wings. And I kept getting the sense that Nadal's ball bouncing up high was playing right into Hercotch's hands. He's tall, and he's really good when he's able to get on top of the ball and flatten it out and get that downward trajectory, especially when he is inside the court off of his forehand wing. I think he hits his forehand way better from shoulder level than he does hip level. And I think that's true on his backhand too. Another very flat stroke where I don't think he does a great job of maintaining uh, pace on the ball when he has to go down low to get his two-hander. But when it's upstairs especially like with his backhand, I think ideal for him is like chest level. Um, I just think he's able to drive it with a lot more conviction. So I thought height of bounce for Hercotch, it just, it, it looked really comfortable. Whereas for some players, when they're playing Nadal on clay, it's, uh, it's really uncomfortable to be having to play balls up high over and over again. I, I think it's ideal for Hercotch. And uh, there, we saw some really impressive backhand down the line redirecting from Hubie, which just got him out of that backhand jail on command. Really, really important when you're playing Nadal and he's whipping cross-court forehands your way. It's not as if, it's not as if you have to beat Nadal in that cross-court exchange because nobody's really going to beat him in that cross-court exchange other than maybe Djokovic at his best. But for Hercotch, he was at least able to get out of that exchange because, and I think this is his best shot, he's so good at just patiently and calmly redirecting that backhand down the line. He was also knocking down the forehand down the line, uh, I think with more offensive intentions, but especially off of his his wide serve on the deuce side, um, I, I think he was nailing his forehand down the line on a consistent basis. So I thought Hercotch just checked all the boxes, some of them in unexpected ways. The part that's expected is the serving disparity is massive, right? So overall, I think you can tell by the way I'm talking about this, Hercotch really surpassed my expectations. And Nadal, in a lot of ways, I thought was okay. Um, if I'm kind of comparing the Djokovic loss and then a dumb loss. I mean, I, I thought, I thought as much as I like to be low, I think her played a lot better than to be low. And I thought Nadal played better than Djokovic. So I thought this was a higher level match, a higher quality match, got very physical. There were a lot of really great points, a lot of great rallies, but at the end of the day, Rafa was outmatched. 
And I think it's hard to know what to make of this because on one hand, this is her Koch on clay. And the record speaks for itself. In terms of, he's somewhat underwhelming on this surface historically. He left Rome, his last three appearances in Rome, Hercotch lost his first match. Nadal shouldn't get crushed by this guy, especially not healthy, right? So no matter how you slice it, getting killed by Hercotch on clay does, especially when it's not Madrid and it's like actually pretty slow clay, it, it does not, on paper, it does not bode well. On the other hand, I test watching the match. Hercotch impressed me in every way possible. And, you know, mainly as I was watching, the thought wasn't, wow, Rafa looks awful. It was mainly, oh my God, Hercotch is really, he's really crushing it out here. Like he is showing some good stuff in many aspects of the game. But then there's the thought, well, what could Nadal have done? What could he have done better? How could this match have been different? And... I'll talk about some bigger picture stuff, but you got to start with the fact that, like, you got to break serve in that opening game. You just have to. He's up love 30. He has an easy forehand pass that he, he could have hit with his drive grip, but he has so much open court, he actually hits it with his slice grip. He has the cross court open, and he just bunts this uh, pretty easy forehand pass wide. Should have been love 40. And then you look at the first two break points at 30-40, he, uh, he has a second serve, and he puts a forehand return into the net. The serve pulled him way out wide. It was a great angle, but Nadal was there in plenty of time. And at the end of the day, it's a second serve return on Nadal's forehand. That should have gone heavy cross-court into Hercotch's backhand. If he hit that with decent depth, Hercotch was not going to be able to redirect it hard down the line, uh, maybe softly down the line, but Nadal should have been in that point. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the second break point, Nadal was dictating with his forehand. And this was a, a really good example of the kind of point that Hercot was winning in this match that before the match, coming into the match, I never would have expected him to be able to win. But Nadal was dictating with his forehand, Hercot scrambling really well just to stay in it. And then eventually, Nadal mishit one of these forehands. Unforced error. It was a pretty easy one. But Rafa had already delivered like seven or eight blows that Hercotch absorbed. And if you look at that point, the the main thing that I would say about Rafa is he has to come in there. Like, he should have been at net, putting away one of those uh, floating defensive efforts by Hercotch. So that brings me to, to one of my points. With Nadal looking so underpowered offensively, one of the things that I think Peak Nadal would have done better was explosive net rushing. And I, I think an, an underrated aspect of coming in and finishing volleys is that speed and quickness really does matter, especially when you have the, the technique that Nadal has where he doesn't really run through the ball all that well. So like when he hits an approach shot, Rafa usually sets his feet, stops, hits the forehand, and then charges in where like Federer will have a, a different sort of technique on it where he'll actually... He'll actually kind of run through the ball. It'll be kind of... Um, he'll hit it off of his... I'm not going to get into details. But essentially, in Tsitsipas as well, the footwork pattern is, is a little bit different so that the momentum, the forward momentum, actually never stops during the forehand approach shot. So with Nadal not having that sort of footwork on his approach shots it takes more speed and quickness to actually get forward and close the distance to the net. And I just think with, with him losing a step here, there were moments where I think prime Nadal is at the net putting away a volley, but this version of Nadal was stuck at the baseline and allowing Hercotch to neutralize and extend rallies. Better first serve damage. On the positive, Nadal seems to be going after his serve fully now. But the effectiveness, as I mentioned, was terrible until midway through the second set, especially even if you look at his uh, first serve win percentage. Um, very, very bad against um, against Hercotch here. Let me see what it was exactly. It was... Why am I not... Why am I not seeing this? Oh, 
52.6% first serve win percentage. So no effectiveness on the first serve and the plus one. It was basically, you know, th those are the numbers you'd expect to see if you start with a neutral baseline rally and you hand feed right down the middle and say, let's play. Um, you could say, look, this is Rafa Nadal on a Rome clay court. What does it matter that his his first serve is never you could say his first serve is never going to be that effective. I, I don't agree. Like if you think about, for example, uh when he beat Djokovic in in Rome, that was uh twenty was that twenty twenty when was that? That was um twenty twenty one. So when he beat Djokovic in Rome twenty twenty one, um in that third set Novak basically missed like two returns every game uh, throughout that third set. Like Nadal was getting free points galore against the best returner of all time in Novak Djokovic because the combination of Nadal's serve quality with his forehand threat would force, especially, especially um, on the righty backhand return on the ad side, it would force returners to go for high degree of difficulty returns and they would miss. So I don't really buy the argument that it's normal for Nadal to get absolutely no free points and it's okay, um, especially in this kind of post-prime athleticism phase of his career. Um, you know, I, I think in his prime, there were more free points and there had to be and it was an important part of his clay court game, especially if you look at um, if you kind of look at post-2019, so like Carlos Moya era, like 2018 and beyond. Another thing I think Rafa would have done had he had it been, you know, three, four years ago is maybe a little bit less reliance on offense. Like if Nadal had more confidence in his physicality, maybe he looks to take some pace off, play more patient, and ask Hercotch to create more and see what happens. Because I think Hubert is a great counterattacker. Not only is he a great defender, but he loves it when his opponents step inside the court and give him pace to work with uh, and kind of drag themselves out of position so that Hercotch can kind of redirect that pace and create more easy offense. But if you, if you take a little pace off and play through the middle more and make Hercotch sort of generate on his own, sometimes he makes errors that way. And Nadal was never able to experiment with that because in order to kind of go to that strategy, you need to be willing to do a little bit more road work. And that's not something Nadal wants to do right now. And then, of course, there's a physical question. Did Nadal struggle to recover? Because, and I know when it comes to all of these stats, the sample sizes were small. And not long ago, I was saying Nadal hasn't won a match over an hour and a half. And then he, he, he's done it a couple times since then. But now I'll give you this small sample size stat. Rafa is 0-2 after playing three-set matches at this point. But, you know, at the same time, I test. I thought Nadal physically looked all right. I did not think he looked bad physically. In fact, I'm pretty confident at this point that he will play Roland Garros. I don't know anything, obviously. And it's, it's just me going off of what he looks like. And that's all. A best of five sets... It's a little worrisome. No doubt about it. It's a little worrisome. But he's played three weeks, three events in a row now. And uh, I, I, to me, it looks like he's playing free. He's moving into the corners aggressively. He's serving more aggressively. And even though, you know, even though the Hercotch match was lopsided, I, I don't think, I don't think he really hit a wall, so to speak, which was good. Physically, I don't think he hit a wall. I think maybe tactically and mentally he hit a wall. So um, I want to end on some Rome draw notes. So just taking stock of where we're at right now. Um, and I'll go from the top quarter and then I'll go down. So top quarter, I was gearing up for a djokovic rude quarter final. It's uh, the round of 16 matches are Tabilo Hachinov and Zhang Montero. So kind of a, kind of an open you know, very much an open top quarter with Hachinov being uh, the favorite. Montero has qualified two tournaments in a row. 
He's uh, really feeling himself on the forehand, red hot there. Uh, Zhang has made runs on clay court masters before. I love his power. I love his ball striking. Doesn't move all that well. Doesn't um, really like to defend. And then Tabilo, I'm curious to see what he has against Hachinov um, because, you know, he, he continues to be a guy. His forehand is terrifying, flat out terrifying. It's funny, he's kind of a better version of Montero, now that I think about it. Much better serve. All right, the, in the next quarter down, the Zverev-Fritz quarterfinal that I predicted is still possible. Now, on paper, this is a really good chance for Zverev. If you look at the entire top half of the draw, this is a great chance for Zverev to make the final and turn his season around because there hasn't been all that much to be uh, super impressed with if you're Alexander Zverev since the Australian Open. He now look. I I still think Fritz knows how to play him. He's a tough matchup. I'm you know I'm still gonna I'm not gonna change my pick. It's still Fritz. But just looking at it, I think that's the main storyline right now in the top half of this Rome draw is can Zverev fight, get some things to click just in time for Roland Garros, where you know with with the health situation and the Djokovic situation. If Zverev wins Rome, he's going to feel like he can win the French. No doubt about it. But, you know, a lot of work to be done for him. Next quarter down, uh, Tsitsipas is my pick coming out of that quarter, and I have him going to the final. Had to battle against Struff as expected. Now he's got Demonor and then Jari or Mueller. I still feel pretty good about him to the final. The bottom quarter is the most interesting to me. Medvedev is healthy. I didn't think he'd be healthy. I don't think he's playing great, but he's healthy. He'll play Tommy Paul next. I'm really intrigued by that one. Um, Baez beat Runa down there. Is Sebastian Baez finally going to make uh, a Masters 1000 clay court run, which I, I've been kind of waiting for. I've been feeling like that's due, but it, it, I'm not even going to say due. I'm going to say overdue. Or... Is Hercotch going to be this year's Medvedev and just kind of go against surface norms and be the guy who makes a run in Rome, even though we thought that, you know, he he maybe wasn't all that capable of, of going on a run here on clay. Again, it's hard to gauge, but I would just couldn't have been more impressed with that performance against Nadal. And overall in the big picture, I'm just, I'm feeling really good about Hercotch right now in general. And I think the second half of the season is going to be great for him. That bottom quarter, Medvedev, Paul, uh, Baez, Hercotch, that is the most interesting quarter to me in terms of entertainment value. Super intrigued to see how all of that shakes up. That'll do it, everybody. I will uh, talk to you for the mailbag later this week. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.